أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, the peak of His creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 5. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-yawma uhilla lakum al-tayyibat. Today, the good foods, everything that is good, has been made lawful to you. Al-yawma uhilla lakum al-tayyibat. Wa ta'amu al-lazina utu al-kitab hillun lakum. وَطَعَامُكُمْ حِلٌّ لَهُنْ And the food of the people of the book has been made lawful to you. And your food is lawful to them. وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ إِذَا آتَيْتُمُوهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنْ And also the chaste women are lawful to you from the believers. And the chaste women from the people of the book have also been made lawful to you if you give them their ujur, their dowry. Sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim. Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One of the most important dimensions in our lives is the institution of marriage our marital lives, you find that Islam places a great emphasis on marriage. No institution has been built in Islam that is more blessed than the institution of marriage. In Surah Al-Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers it one of His grand signs. In Surah Al-Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the grand signs. Allah has created you from clay. Allah has created the heavens and the earth. Look at the diversity of your languages and your colors. Amongst these signs, Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Allah considers having a partner in whom you find peace and sukoon and tranquility is one of His grand signs. In another verse, in Surah An-Nisa, Verse 21, Allah even calls the marital relationship mithaq ghalid, which means a firm, deep oath. You know, the Quran only refers to the deep oath three times. If you examine the Quran, you find this phrase mithaq ghalid is mentioned only three times. Two of these times, Allah uses it for very important matters. For instance, when Allah speaks to Bani Israel and He speaks about the covenant they made with Allah and the whole Sabbath, Allah says, Mithaqan Ghalidah. When Allah speaks to His prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, I took a very firm oath from my prophets. وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمْ وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُمْ مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a firm oath from His prophets. So when Allah, the King of the universe, says firm oath, it really means it's significant. The third instance where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this firm oath is where? Surah An-Nisa verse 21. وَكَيْفَ تَأْخُذُونَهُ وَقَدْ أَفْضَى بَعْضُكُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ وَأَخَذْنَ مِنْكُمْ مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا the Qur'an is rebuking those men 
who would violate their marital obligations towards their wives. The Holy Quran says, how is it that you violate these marital rights when your wives took a firm oath from you? This is a firm oath. Some of us, we think marriage is a game. Who cares? I don't have any obligations. I can live the way I want. I don't have to fulfill anything towards her, towards him. The Quran calls it mithaq ghalil. Be careful. This is a sacred covenant between the husband and the wife. See it as a sacred covenant. Treat it with respect and significance. So we know that marriage is extremely important. Now there's one very important question about marriage that many people ask about today. And some people have objections about Islamic laws when it comes to this aspect. Does Islam recognize the marriage of Muslims to non-Muslims? We know that in our Islamic law, there are restrictions on whom you can marry. And we know that generally speaking, when it comes to most categories of non-Muslims, such as atheists, pagans, mushrikeen, Islam does not recognize this as a valid marriage. Some people have the objection that this is discrimination. So what is the Islamic ruling on marrying people from other faiths, what we call interfaith marriages? Why did Islam place these res restrictions? And did the Quran make any exceptions for non-Muslims that you can marry? If yes, who are they? And does that only apply to the woman who's a non-Muslim or does it also apply to the man? And why is there a difference? This is a very important discussion that we will have with you this evening. When it comes to interfaith marriage and marrying people from other faiths, the Holy Quran has a clear verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 221. The Quran does not recognize marriage with mushrikeen as a valid marriage. This is something all Muslim scholars have accepted. Because in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 221, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَلَا تَنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنَّ Do not marry the female pagans until they believe. وَلَا أَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكَةٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ even if there is a female slave, meaning someone who's low class, poor, doesn't come from the class that you're looking for. Even if there is a female slave, but she's mu'min, she has iman, she is better than for you than a pagan, even if you're more interested in that pagan. Even if she has more wealth, more prestige, more beauty, doesn't matter. This believing lady is better for you. وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And you, ladies, don't marry a man who's mushrik, who's a pagan, who's an idol worshiper. وَلَا عَبْدٌ مُؤْمِنٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكُمْ A slave who has iman is better for you than one who's a pagan, who may be powerful, who may be rich. Why? Ya Quran, why? What's the difference? Someone can come and say this is discrimination. The Quran states, The difference is that people who worship idols, people who have no faith, people who are atheists, in reality they're calling to the fire of hell. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Iman is inviting you to believe. So there is consensus amongst Muslim scholars that a Muslim cannot marry someone who's a mushrik, a pagan, an atheist. Mad Muslims in general, you cannot marry them. This is not recognized by Islamic law. We'll look at the exception of the people of the book soon. But how do we today, we live in a society that tells you don't discriminate. Any human should have the same rights. Why is it that your religion does not allow you to marry an atheist? At the end of the day, isn't the atheist a human being created by the God that you worship? That person who worships the idols or the person who says, I don't have any deen, any religion. Why can't you marry them? At the end of the day, they're humans. So why does Islam discriminate when it comes to allowing you to whom you can marry? 
This is a very important objection that must be addressed. I will share with you the following points in giving you the response to this objection. The first point over here is that when you marry someone, you live with someone, you become intimate with someone, there must be some solid common ground between you and that is what we call compatibility. When it comes to someone who does not believe in God, an atheist, there is not much common ground between you. In fact, there isn't any common ground between you. Because you as a mu'min, as a Muslim, you see this entire universe, this entire life from the lens of divine laws, from the lens of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas an atheist says, this Lord that you're worshipping, I laugh at this Lord. I don't even believe in this Lord. It's a fairy tale that you're worshipping. That's what an atheist really says. That's why they reject the existence of God. To them, it's a fairy tale. How can I live every day with an intimate partner who basically sees my prayer as a fairy tale, my Lord as a fairy tale, my Quran as a fairy tale, my prophet as an imposter? There's no common ground. You need common ground with someone to live with peacefully, decently. An atheist who doesn't have any fixed moral foundations, do anything, fine. Alcohol, go and drink. Pork, eat it, dance, go do whatever you want. Go to the beach in any attire that you want. How do you live with someone like that? You have laws. You're preparing for your akhirah. You're raising a family. You cannot live with someone who doesn't have morality inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no common ground. Secondly, living with such a person influences you. If I'm in love with this person, I live with this person day and night and this person doesn't believe in God. Eventually, this person will influence me. I could end up influencing them, yes. But the danger also exists that this person is going to influence me. Islam says, you cannot put yourself in that position. You have to protect yourselves and your families. You cannot put yourself in a relationship knowing that this relationship has the potential to take away your iman and faith. You're causing severe damage to yourself if you put yourself in that situation. The third point, today, in this world, in our country, you do treat people differently based on what they believe in and based also on certain factors like citizenship and geography. Today here in Canada, if you're a Canadian citizen, you have certain rights. If you're not a Canadian citizen, you're still a human, you're respected. But you don't have the same rights. You don't have the same privileges, right? During the pandemic, didn't the government of Canada give many of you monthly payments, right, to compensate? How come I, a non-Canadian, didn't get that from your government? Aren't I a human being? How come the government of Canada didn't put those $2,000 a month in my bank account? I'm a human being too. No, I'm not a citizen. Canada recognizes certain rights for Canadian citizens, they give it to them. If you're not a citizen, you're not entitled to those rights, right? So we have this concept of political citizenship. Islam tells us there's something more important than political citizenship. That's religious citizenship. When you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the Quran and in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you accept this message of God, you get certain rights. One of them is the marital right. So yes, here we even see governments treating you differently based on what you believe. Because the objection is, why does Islam treat you differently based on what you believe? Governments do that all the time. In the United States, if you go back to the 40s, during the Cold War, right? 40s, 50s, 60s, read about an era and policies called McCarthyism. In the United States, if someone was accused of having communist ideas and beliefs, they would lose their job and the government sometimes would imprison them or would take away certain privileges from them. What did I do wrong? Did I kill someone? No. What did I do wrong? No, you're, you're with the Soviets. You're advocating for communism. We cannot tolerate that. We cannot accept that. You see, even government sometimes will treat you differently based on what you believe. So when it comes to marrying someone who's not a Muslim, 
who doesn't believe in God, there isn't much common ground. And this is not unique to the religion of Islam. Look at the Abrahamic faiths and look at the Bible. The Bible bans its followers. Now whether they follow it or not, that's not my business, right? But the Bible bans its followers from marrying non-believers. It does ban interfaith marriages in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. I'll share with you the references. For instance, you find in the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible says to Christians, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Don't be in a relationship with non-believers. For what partnership for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Can you live with someone who doesn't believe in your laws? What kind of a partnership is that? You as a Christian, you have to be righteous. The non-believer is lawless according to the Bible. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? The Bible says, you as a believer, you have light. The non-believer doesn't have light. They're darkness. What kind of fellowship and partnership can exist between light and darkness? That's in the New Testament. So those who object to Islam, tell them. It's in the Bible as well. And I will share with you now the verse from the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 to 4, the Bible says, you shall not intermarry with them, those who worship the idols, the Bible says you cannot intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. This is banned. Why? For they would turn away your sons from following me, meaning from following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to serve other gods, to serve other idols. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. According to the Old Testament, if you marry someone who's a non-believer, you will be destroyed quickly, according to the Old Testament. So this is not unique to the religion of Islam. Hence, Islam was very clear. It did not approve of any marriage between a mu'min and a mushrik. And by the way, the best proof that you can share with other Muslims that Abu Talib was a mu'min and a Muslim is that the Prophet ﷺ did not tell his wife Fatima bint Asad, who was a mu'min and a Muslim, he did not tell her, separate from your husband, Abu Talib. Because Islam commanded those to separate. Islam told the believers, now that you've become believers and your spouse stays as a mushrik, I know it's a tough trial, but you have to separate. But the Prophet allowed Abu Talib to stay in the marriage with Fatima bint Asad, which is the best proof that Abu Talib was a mu'min in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that he was not a mushrik. So the position of the Quran is very clear over here. That marrying someone who's a non-Muslim, who's a mushrik is banned. All scholars, Sunni, Shia have agreed. Let's now come to the exception. Is there an exception to this rule? Yes, there is an exception to this rule. Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 5. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah talks about a special relationship that Muslims can have with the people of the book. Ahl al-Kitab, such as the Christians and the Jews. Allah states, Al-Yawma uhilla lakum al-Tayyibat. Oh believers, if you find some restrictions in your dietary law, don't be upset like some youth today. Oof, look at the Islamic dietary system. This haram, this is halal. I want to go and eat that Whopper hamburger. I can't. They tell me it's haram. Right? Allah says, Whatever Allah makes lawful to you, it's tayyib, it's pure, it's good for you. And whatever Allah has made haram, it's bad for you. Accept the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Appreciate that. So Allah states, اليوم أحل لكم الطيبات وطعام الذين أوتوا الكتاب حل لكم And the food of the people of the book is halal for you. Today there are some new Muslims who are saying that the meat of the people of the book is halal per this ayah. وطعام الذين أوتوا الكتاب حل لكم don't bring me what this scholar said and what that marja said. I don't care. Look at the Quran. The Quran is very clear that the food of the people of the book is halal. So if I live in a Christian society, if I go to a Jewish shop, I can eat whatever I want. There are some people who are advocating for this today. But what does the Quran mean? 
You have to understand the language of the Quran the day it was revealed, then you apply it to your circumstances. Do you know what the word ta'am originally meant? Look at old dictionaries and, and linguistic encyclopedias, such as Lisan al Arab, one of the oldest lexicons and dictionaries that we have in Arabic is Lisan al Arab by Ibn Manzur. Ibn Manzur tells us that the word ta'am fi lughati ahl al hijaz al burru khassa. He says the word ta'am in the language of the hijazis, the people who lived in Arabia, originally it meant wheat. It refers to the grains, wheat. So when the Quran said, wa ta'amu al ladhina utu al kitab hallun lakum, the Quran is not talking about meat. The Holy Quran is talking about the grains. It's talking about wheat. Basically, the Quran is saying, you Muslims and you people of the book, don't put sanctions on each other. Live decently as one community. Both of you believe in the Almighty God. You believe in scriptures. Don't boycott one another. You Muslims say, no, I'll never buy bread from a you know, Christian. No, don't say that. You can go and buy bread from them. You can buy wheat from them. So the word ta'am linguistically doesn't mean meat. It means what? It means wheat. And the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have clarified. Also, your food is lawful to them, meaning there are no sanctions. They can buy food from you as well. Islam wanted to promote a beautiful society where you had harmony, you had interfaith harmony. Then here's the point, the exception when it comes to marriage. What does the Quran now say? The chaste women who are believers, you can marry them. Who else can you marry? And also the chaste woman from Ahlul Kitab, from the people of the book, you're allowed to marry them, give them their dowry. Give them their dowry, this is a valid marriage. Hence, you find that most of our scholars throughout history all Muslims have agreed on this, Sunni and Shia as well. Most scholars have said that a Muslim man may marry a Christian or Jewish woman, any woman from the people of the Kitab. Why? According to this verse. Now, what's the difference between them and the Mushrikeen? There is a world of difference. With Ahlul Kitab, you do have some common ground. Both of you believe in God as the creator of the universe. Both of you believe in, in many of the prophets of God. Both of you believe in what? In the holy scriptures. Both of you believe in moral values, right? The Bible talks about adultery, it's not good. Theft, it's not good. Usury, it's not good. You have a lot of shared values. Even the Bible talks about the lustful look. You know, the Bible tells you, look, the look that's haram, it's banned in the Bible. The Bible even talks about the hijab. Look at how much commonality you have. You're surprised, yes, that the Bible talks about the hijab? Look at this verse. In Corinthians 11, 4 to 8. Look what Paul says here about the belief of Christianity. But every woman who prays or prophecies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. This is the New Testament, the Bible. It says there is a difference between men and women when they pray, which is also the same ruling for us in times of salah. It says that any woman who prays with her head uncovered, I know Christians don't really practice this today, but it's in their Bible. Any woman who prays with her head uncovered, she's dishonoring her head. She's dishonoring herself. He says it's like shaving her head. You know when a woman shaves her head, that's considered disgraceful in most communities. The Bible says that's, that's exactly what she's doing. She's disgracing herself. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. It's a disgrace according to the Bible. See, you have at least some shared values with someone who comes from the people of the book. That's why Islam has allowed it given certain circumstances and conditions. So the Quran does make an exception over here. However, is this recommended or not? Al-Imam al-Sadiq was asked, okay, clearly the Quran allows it. Do you recommend it? The Imam salam says, generally, I don't recommend it. Because when a Muslim man marries a Christian or Jewish lady, 
you have the issue of raising children. This issue might create tension for many people. These days, I see some people, they're in love, they're youth, right? The brother has met a non-Muslim lady from the people of the book. And I tell this person, you know, tomorrow, have you thought this through raising your children? Yes, yes, say it. We're not right now in love. Anything she wants, I want, she's going to say yes. I tell him, Habibi, today you're in love, she's saying that. Tomorrow, when reality hits you both, you know, when you get married, you finally wake up and see what the world is about. When reality strikes you, then are you both going to be on the same page? I know today you're both on the same page. But five years from now, ten years from now, you're going to be on the same page? Tomorrow your in-laws, if her, if her family are committed Christians, don't think they won't pressure her to have you know, the kids grow up as Christians. Do you want to put yourself in that situation? I know today you're on the same page and she tells you, yes, you can you know, take them to the masjid, you can raise them as Muslims, but that can change tomorrow. If she feels passionate about her faith, look, if you love your faith, you want your kids to have your faith. This is natural human need. If I respect my faith and my church, I want my kids to have the same faith. <clears throat> so tomorrow that could change. Are you ready for that? This will create tension. So the imam was alerting his companion. Be careful. You must guarantee that number one, she's not going to influence you. Number two, you will raise your children according to the Holy Quran. You must be guaranteed. If you don't have such guarantee, don't think about it. This may not be good for you. So it's not recommended in Islamic law, but it is permissible. And hence, my dear brothers and sisters, nearly half of our scholars, you know what they have said? Upon examining verse 5 of Surah Al-Ma'idah, they have said that what is permissible with the women of Ahl al-Kitab is temporary marriage, not permanent marriage. Because scholars are split. Some of them say permanent marriage is acceptable, makruh, but it's acceptable. Some of them say no, it's not recognized. Only temporary marriage is recognized. Why? Why is temporary marriage only recognized? Because it will give the Muslim man the opportunity to test compatibility. Today, you mo both are you know, very rosy with your words. You say, yes, we're going to live peacefully together. That temporary window gives you an opportunity to see if this is sustainable. Live with her a year, two years, and then you can assess whether you should have children or not and continue this relationship. See if it's still positive. She still respects your values. You can still raise your children according to the Quran. That's why many scholars have said only temporary marriage is allowed. And then that will also give her a window to know Islam. Believe me, if they know the beauty of the Quran and the beauty of Islam, they will embrace Islam because Islam does not negate Christianity. It's just a continuation of Christianity. You still believe in the Virgin Mary. You still believe in Prophet Isa salam. Give her that window. Once she accepts your faith, then you can decide to have a family and to raise children. So this is the exception that the Holy Quran made. Yes, I understand scholars have differences of opinion here about what type of marriage is allowed, but because there is some common ground with the people of the book, the Quran in general, in general legalized it. So we know that a Muslim man can marry a Christian woman, a Jewish woman, any woman from the people of the book. What about the opposite scenario? Today I get many youth and coming and telling me, look at this sexist religion. This is discrimination. How come a Muslim man can marry a Christian woman? But a Muslim woman cannot marry a Christian man. What's the difference? Why are you discriminating? Why are you giving two different laws over here? The more you investigate Islamic laws, my dear brothers and sisters, the more you come to appreciate them. I will share with you the main reason why Islam allowed a Muslim man to marry a Christian woman in certain con with, you know, circumstances, but not the other way around. All scholars throughout the history of Islam have agreed a Muslim woman can only marry a Muslim man. Why is there this difference? Historically, if you examine the issue of guardianship, historically, who's the guardian of the family? who decides the religion of the family and who imposes his religion on the family. Is it the father or the mother historically in most societies? 
Historically, the father, the husband is the guardian, the legal guardian, the religious guardian, and he is the one who imposes his religion. Yes, the mother is really important in raising the children, but the father decides the religion for the house. He can exercise that authority because most societies around the world are patriarchal. The husband is the one who has more authority. Therefore, the Quran recognizes this. If you allow a Muslim lady to marry a non-Muslim man, in most societies, he will exercise authority on her, pressuring her to give up her faith. And you know this is the recommendation of the Bible? See what the Bible says. The Bible in Ephesians 5.22 commands Christian men. Listen, this is the Bible. If a woman marries a Christian man, a Christian man has this biblical verse that he has to listen to. Wives, I'm, I'm quoting the Bible. These are not my words. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. What does the Bible tell Christian men and Christian women? Wives, submit to your husbands like you would submit to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Just as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of his family, is the head of his wife. In another chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 11.3, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So when a Christian man is being told by his Bible, you're the head of your family and your wife needs to submit to you, how do you allow a Muslim woman to be in that situation? This would be an act of injustice against the Muslim woman because naturally her society, her environment, would eventually pressure her to give up her faith or to weaken her faith. She wouldn't dare raise her children according to the Quran when you have these restrictions. Yes, today you might live in some open societies that are not really affected by this, but the Quran is for all ages, for all people, for most circumstances. We have to appreciate why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim man. This is extremely important for us to consider. And believe me, the man has the power to be aggressive and enforce his views. Today, if you look at the rates of domestic violence, you find that 85% of victims of domestic violence are women, not men. 15% are men. A man can intimidate his wife. He can threaten him. But usually in most societies, even today, even today in the West, a wife is less aggressive with her husband. She uses the threat of force less. It's the man who uses the threat of force, not the woman. Yes, once I did have a friend one day, I saw him, he was upset. I told him, Habibi, what's the matter with you? With so much calmness as if nothing happened. He told me, Sayyid, my wife beat me up. I told him, what? Are you kidding? He said, la, wallah, Sayyidna, my wife beat me up. I told him, mashallah, with all this size, your wife beat you up? He was like, yeah, Adi, she beats me up all the time. I told him, are you serious? He's like, well, let's say it, I'm serious. I told him, why does she beat you up? He says, whenever we get into an argument, she doesn't like it, she beats me up. I told him, and that's okay with you? I think he enjoyed his wife beating him up. But that's unusual, right? Usually the domestic violence, if you look at the statistics, who is the victim of domestic violence? It's the woman. The man can be aggressive with her. The man can intimidate her. My dear brothers and sisters, I myself, sisters have come who were married, you know, let's say to someone who embraced the religion of Islam, and then that person left the religion of Islam due to the environment or, you know, the media, the brainwashing. A sister once told me, my husband left Islam, he came in front of my own daughters, he started to curse Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa using very profane words. That destroys the woman when that happens to her, and the man has the threat of force. See, when you allow a Muslim to marry a non-Muslim man, that non-Muslim man doesn't respect her prophet necessarily. He may, he may not. Whereas a Muslim man marrying a Christian lady, he has to respect her prophet. Because if you as a Muslim man condemn Jesus, you're not a Muslim anymore. You're condemning your own Quran. A Muslim man who's married to a Christian lady, he respects her prophets. He respects Isa alayhi salam. 
He doesn't condemn him. He doesn't say Jesus is an imposter, he's a liar. He doesn't say that. If you say that, you're not a Muslim. But if a Muslim lady marries a non-Muslim man, the non-Muslim man doesn't believe in the Prophet. He could tell her he was an imposter. I don't even believe in his message. I don't believe in your Quran. And he can even attack Rasulullah You cannot put a Muslim lady in that position. There is a huge difference between a Muslim man marrying a non-Muslim woman and a Muslim woman marrying a non-Muslim man. You cannot compare between the two. Men can be aggressive, they can be threatening, and the lady might have to give up her faith. That happens sometimes. We've seen many tragedies. But the other scenario is very unlikely. I myself, I don't say it doesn't exist. I myself, I've never heard. A man who says, my wife, she came very aggressive, threatening me about religion. It could happen, but it's very rare. Threatening me to change my religion or, sh or she'll beat me up. Unless the guy is like this poor friend that I had, maybe. But for most people, that's not the case, right? It doesn't really happen that often. Even in today's world, we're not talking about 14 centuries ago. Even in our Western society today, this is not that common. Now why, my dear brothers and sisters, today we are seeing some sisters wanting to marry non-Muslim men? I'll be very frank with you. This is happening in some communities. And what do we do about that? How do we address this issue? I will tell you the main causes why a Muslim sister may want to marry a Muslim man. Number one, when feelings develop, she falls in love. When you fall in love, you can't think straight anymore. You are unable to think of the consequences. That's why my recommendation for every human being is, whether you're young or old, you're married or not married, it doesn't matter. You, when you fall in love severely, I do believe you, you can't control your feelings anymore. Some youth, they come to me say, well, I can't, I can't help it, I can't control it. I tell them, I believe you. You're not a liar. I know what the power of love can do. But you allowed yourself to come to this position. You could have stopped it. The first day when you feel those initial feelings developing, be smart and say no. Ask yourself, am I able to sustain this relationship? Is it good for me? If yes, okay, go fall in love, get engaged, and get married. But if you, my dear youth, if you're right now not at a position where you can, marry, you can get married, and you know that, you know right now I can't. Realistically, I can't get married right now. Not now, not next year, maybe five years from now. If you know that, don't allow your heart to develop feelings. Because when your heart develops an attachment, you're stuck. You're stuck. You'll cause yourself emotional pain and damage. I see many youth, they're in love, they have no way out. They have absolutely no way out. They can't get married anytime soon. They're scared to tell their families, why'd you do this to yourself? Say it, I can't help it. I know now you can help it. You cannot help it, but six months ago you could have. The first day when you saw her and you saw the emotions developing, do mercy to yourself and stop. Don't let this grow because you know you're not in a position right now to pursue this relationship. You brought this to yourself. You're still responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there are married people. There are married people who go through the same thing. The guy sees a woman. He's married. She's married at work. They say each other every day. They flirt. They joke. Adi, it's okay. And then the feelings develop and the person is not happy with his marriage. She's not happy with her marriage. This is happening every day in our communities. And then he comes saying, well, I can't do anything about it. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. What am I gonna, my, my heart is imprisoning me. No, you could have done something about it. Last year, that first time when you joked with her and flirted with her, right? And you allowed these feelings to develop, you could have done something. Now I know you're stuck, but you allowed yourself to come to this level. From the first day, be smart, say no. Realize the consequences. So this is one reason, they, you know, she meets him at college, at work, somewhere. She falls in love with him, she wants to marry him. Be careful before you allow your heart to get attached to anyone. Make sure your heart is being attached to the right person at the right time. If you implement this, you will have a peaceful life, trust me. We've seen too many cases and examples. That's one factor. You know what the second factor is? This one's really heartbreaking. The second reason is because sometimes parents are irrational 
Many good people come to propose for their daughter. They keep rejecting them one after the other. No, no. Let her study. Let her finish her bachelor's. Yalla Habibi, she finished her bachelor's. Nah, I want another master's. Let her get a PhD. She's now 28. She has a PhD. She doesn't have many opportunities anymore. Let's face it, my dear brothers and sisters. A man who's successful, he's 30, 32. He has his business, right? And now he wants to get married. I'm not saying this is good, but this is the reality. This man is not really interested in a 28-year-old who has a PhD. Because when her level of education is more than his level, he feels intimidated. Brothers tell me. Brothers tell me this all the time. Sayyid, I, I admire the fact that she has a PhD, but I don't want to live with someone who has a PhD. She's going to have the upper hand. I want to be the man in the house. I'm not telling you this is right or wrong. This is wrong, but this is reality. That's why the guy who's 30, who's looking for a girl, he's looking for the girl who's 24 and 25, not for the one who's 28 who has a PhD. If he doesn't have a PhD, he feels insecure. He doesn't want to marry a woman with a PhD. This is the reality of most of our communities. And the parents don't know this. They damage the future of their daughters. So now they have a limited uh, you know, number of people who are, going, who are going to come and propose. And many times you see at, 20, at age 28 and 30, the proposals stop coming. A decent person doesn't come anymore. So this lady has no option but to go and fall in love with a non-Muslim and then she wants to marry him. Her parents are the culprit over here. On the day of judgment, Allah will hold her parents accountable. Allah will tell them 10 years suitors are coming. They're coming and proposing. Why do you say no? What's your excuse when you said no? Didn't that person have good akhlaq and deen? Why'd you turn him away? No, she was still studying. No, you know, he doesn't have the money that I want. He doesn't have the degrees that I want. He doesn't have the, you know, there was a father. A man came to propose, not in this community, in another community. A person came to propose for his daughter. So that intermediary, the wasta, he went and he told him, Hajiflan, there is a person who wants to propose. He's very decent. He asked two questions. Two. Two questions about this person. Look at the mentality of many parents. He asked two questions. How much money does he have? And what village is he from? Yes, he even asked about the village. You know, that... Because, you know, if you marry someone from your village, خلص, it's guaranteed you're going to be happy. You're never going to be, you know, separated. You're never going to fight. You're never going to abuse each other. These are the only two questions this man asked. What's his job? How much money? And which village? Not even the country. He, didn't, he wasn't even happy to be from the same country. No, no, no. The same village. And what village is he from? Is this going to bring happiness to your daughter? That's not what brings happiness. And many parents fail to realize this important reality. Have someone who has deen and akhlaq, someone who fears Allah will never oppress your daughter. He will be loyal to your daughter, even if he doesn't have much. Honestly, I'm against the idea of waiting for our children. Let them graduate and just pile up those degrees and then they, you get married. If an opportunity comes, let them get married. He's going to college, she's going to college, fine. Is there a verse in the Quran that says you can't get married while you're in college? Believe me, there's nothing more beautiful than a young man going to class at college and a young woman going to class at college. At the end of the day, they come back together in their small studio and they're living as a married couple. There's nothing more beautiful than that. They support each other during these days of difficulty. He's there for her. She's there for him. Who told you you need a mansion in order to get married? Be humble. How much does it cost to rent a small studio? I know now with the COVID, rents are crazy, right? Tripled in some places, maybe doubled in some places. But honestly, how much does it take? If he has a part-time part -time job, she has a part-time job, the families help. You can rent a small one-room apartment, a small studio, and you're going to college, and then you finish the degree, and then let your family grow. That's beautiful. Now you have that shared history with one another. But many parents, they don't understand this. They kept rejecting, they keep rejecting, rejecting. And then the lady is now in a miserable situation. There's no one to propose. She goes and marries a non-Muslim man. The parents are to blame. My dear brothers and sisters, once a sister sent me an email. 
She said, Sayyid, I want to commit suicide. I'm depressed. I don't know what to do. Why? She says, I'm 28. My parents have rejected every single proposal that has come. I don't have hope in life anymore. I want to commit suicide. The, plan, the parents are to blame. Why? Who gave you this authority? Who gave you this authority? The Prophet says the person has deen, has akhlaq, is decent, is humble. Accept. Don't look for all these other descriptions and all these other criteria. Those are not going to bring you happiness, brothers and sisters. So this is one reason that is very important and we need to address that. Now, the final point. If this happens, how do we react to that? I know some parents, when their daughter marries a non-Muslim, they kick her out of the house, they condemn her, they say she's not a Muslim anymore, that's it. I don't know you, you don't know me. This is wrong. A lady who marries a non-Muslim man is committing a sin. Sure, it's a grave sin, but she's still Muslim. I have no right to say that you're not Muslim. What, you think all Muslims are angels? Look at what Muslims do around the world. Don't you think Muslims drink, commit adultery, commit sins? This lady is still a Muslim. If she believes in the Quran, she's praying, she's accepting Islamic principles, she's still a Muslim. You as a family cannot say she's not a Muslim, that's it, I've cut all ties with her. Haram. She's still your daughter. Yes, condemn it. Using an effective approach, try to talk her out of it. Try to see if there's an opportunity for the man to become a Muslim. If he becomes a Muslim, he says the shahadatain, fine, we don't have a legal problem. Do your best. Try to find a solution. If she insists, tell her, I'm not happy with this. I don't approve of this. Between me and Allah, I'm telling you. I tell the whole family, I don't approve of this. But you're, she's still your daughter. You still have to stay in touch with her. You can't say, I cut ties till the end of my life. Wrong. That's not Islamic. That's cultural. The person is still Muslim. Keep ties. Ask Allah to guide her. Talk to her in a gentle way. Meet the man, see if you can bring him to the religion of Islam. Believe me, I myself, I've tried it. Once uh, a brother came, he was uh, coming to do his you know, engagement and to also become Muslim. So, you know, I want to make sure that he is not being forced into this or pressured or just for the sake of marriage. I want him to fall in love with Islam. So I told him, have you read about Islam? He said, yes, I know some things about Islam. So I asked him to explain to me, summarize for me, what Islam is. So he did. He had some very basic understanding. I told him, can I give you an overview of what Islam is? He said, of course, I would love that. 45 minutes, I gave him an overview of Islam to show him the real teachings of Islam. His parents were standing there. His mom started to cry. His mom started to cry. She said, if what you described is the religion of Islam, we all should become Muslims. Give that opportunity. Let the man come. Tell him, come. Explore the Quran. We're one family. Islam is a continuation of Christianity. Let me tell you what the Quran says about Jesus. Many times you have a solution. But there are some stubborn parents. No, that's it. I kick you out of my house, out of my life. Gone. Ma'assalam. This is not Islamic. So parents do have this obligation in these very difficult times to be firm with their faith, but be flexible. If a good opportunity comes, don't say no to that opportunity. Believe me, Allah will hold us responsible. The Prophet says, the Prophet says, 14 centuries ago, subhanAllah, he's looking at our society today. If a person comes and his deen, his, com his commitment is good, his akhlaq is good. What does it mean for his akhlaq to be good? He's not selfish, he's not arrogant, he's humble. You can talk to the guy. You can communicate with him. He's gentle. He has a good heart. The Prophet says, approve. If she wants, approve. Don't force her. If she wants, approve. If you don't, what's the warning from Rasulullah? If you don't, there will be a massive fitna on earth. Trials and controversy in society and mass corruption. These are the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these blessed nights to open our hearts for the path of guidance. Last night was Laylatul Qadr al-Kubra. 
I ask Allah that He accept it from all of you. Inshallah, Allah willed for all of you the best, most beautiful year. But my dear brothers and sisters, after Laylatul Qad, stay focused. Often, Laylatul Qad, we go through that spiritual ascension and then we go downhill. Maintain that spiritual energy. Believe me, life is not worth it. Always see the beauty of Allah, the beauty of Quran, the beauty of the Ahlul Bayt. Let that beauty captivate you throughout the year. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have accepted all of your a'mal, all of your deeds. Inshallah, Allah willed for you the best, most pros prosperous, beautiful year. Let's now raise our hands in dua. There is a mu'min who needs our dua, my dear brothers and sisters. He's in a difficult situation. For him and for all the ill people that you know, raise your hands in dua and recite this holy verse five times together. Everyone. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amman yujibul mudhtar idha da'a huwa yakshifu su. Amman. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله نسألك اللهم باسمك العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم اشفي كل مريض اللهم فرج عن كل مكروب ومهموم اللهم سد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة, ثواب سورة الفاتحة مسبوقة بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد